And I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and participating in the debate for the 7th Bristol District State Rep and District 1 for the Governor's Council race. Um, I'd like to also Your, your city committee secretary is Judy Conrad. Your city committee affirmative action is Debbie Fastino. Um, we have a new position in the city democratic committee and that is communications director, unfortunately, um, Marcy Yitkin had a family issue that she had to tend to, so she won't be able to make it. Uh, but I want to introduce you to the vice chair for the City Democratic Committee, and that's James Cusick. <laughs> I want to just thank a few other people. I want to thank BCC for allowing us to use this room. I want to thank <laughs> Reverend... I'd like to thank Reverend Lawrence for taking the time to moderate for us tonight. I want, to, I want to give a big thank you to the candidates for um, participating in this debate tonight. And I want to thank all of you as guests to be here as well. We appreciate your support. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. If everyone could please turn their cell phones off, we would appreciate it so there's no distractions for the candidates. Um, we would like to keep the applause, certainly when they do their opening and at the end, but we have a very, very tight schedule, so we're asking out of respect to please keep your applause until the end of the debate so we can ask all the questions in a timely fashion and they have plenty of time to answer for you. Um, the candidates information and volunteer sheets are outside this door. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer for a candidate, please sign up for them and we'll make sure that we get your information to the appropriate campaigns. Um, we also have a sheet out there if you're not part of the Democratic Committee and you want to become a member, there's a sheet out there as well. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Sprague to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Sprague. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy, for uh, arranging this opportunity in the Democratic Party. Um, I want to uh, make clear, of course, that BCC is proud to host these events. It's in a nonpartisan fashion that we do so, and should other parties uh, request uh, the facilities, we will certainly make ourselves available in that regard. Uh, welcome to BCC. Most of you have been here before in one way or another. This is an actual classroom, and I think it's uh, uh, fitting for uh, things that we want to learn tonight. It's a learning exercise tonight. Uh, I want to thank the candidates myself for putting themselves, first for putting themselves out to run uh, for political office, and secondly to be here tonight uh, uh, to participate in this debate, which is a learning exercise. And this is all about what uh, uh, BCC's mission calls for. We want to provide ourselves, uh, make our resources available to the community uh, for such uh, public education <coughs> forums. And uh, I want to get out of here right now so we can go right into the, uh, into the forum and the, and the, uh, the actual debate. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the moderator uh, for this debate, Reverend Lawrence, Robert Lawrence. Uh, and who is, uh, I think everyone will agree, a real jewel of our city and the region. We're very fortunate to have him uh, working here uh, day and night, as he always does, uh, out everywhere in the community, the face of the community. And uh, we couldn't have picked a better person to be the moderator for this important event than uh, Reverend Robert Lawrence. So it's my honor. Please welcome Reverend Robert Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Sprager, and welcome, everybody. And uh, uh, when I was invited by the uh, Democratic uh, Party Committee here, uh, Sandy Dennis and the others, to uh, uh, be and with you and to moderate this occasion, I, uh, I jumped at the uh, opportunity because 
This, this is really, this is democracy in action. Uh, this is where it's at. Uh, to hear the candidates and to uh, uh, everyone to have an opportunity to uh, hear what they have to say relative to some questions that I have and to uh, volunteer outside and to carry the message into the community. And then on the primary of Tuesday, excuse me, Thursday, Thursday, September 6th, uh, primary day here in Fall River, uh, you people will have the final word. So thanks again. In the interest of time, let's move right along. Um, uh, we know uh, the candidates. Uh, we, at a flip of a coin, uh, we have decided that Alan Sylvia will be speaker number one, and Kevin Agia will be speaker number two, and we will alternate uh, those, uh, those roles, and, to, uh, and they will have each three minutes uh, for an opening statement. Uh, there will be a two-minute opportunity for rebuttal uh, at the conclusion of their two statements, and then uh, we will then go into the second question, and as you've been advised, uh, hold your applause till the very end, and then we can uh, open it up. So uh, that's the format, uh, and uh, let's begin with question number one. No, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I hadn't forgotten that. <laughs> uh, we, uh, as I said, with the flip of the coin, uh, we will have, well, we have a timer right up here in front. Uh, and uh, so she's going to keep us uh, honest with the clock, and, uh, and the candidates can see uh, her sign as to uh, the limitation of that time period. So as I indicated earlier, uh, speaker number one will start tonight with his opening statement for three minutes, and by choice, we're going to ask Mr. Alan Sylvia to begin. Thank you, Reverend. Good evening. I would like to first start to thank the Democratic City Committee for hosting this evening's yes. event. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, I decided long ago to run for the office of state representative because I feel that we have no voice on Beacon Hill. I am a lifelong resident of Fall River. I love Fall River and I love its people. I have more than 45 years of public service. In 1970, I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, served throughout Southeast Asia and the Pacific during the Vietnam conflict. When I returned to Fall River, I went to college and for more than 20 years served proudly as a member of the Fall River Police Department. When I, when I came back from the, from the, uh, in our, with, with the police department, after all, most of my career has been in law enforcement. And now I ask to be your legislator, your lawmaker, and I pledge never to be a lawbreaker. My opponent has accused me of negative campaigning. However, you will see that our campaign is about positive values, truth, honesty, and transparency. And in my book, the truth is always positive. I believe that state government can do much more for us. But let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, in the eyes of most state officials, we here at Fall River are second-class citizens. Why? I've asked them on the Hill, you should, because we are weak, we have no voice, no teeth. And in our case, in the South End, we actually have no voice at all. My opponent voted 100% with the Speaker of the House. Only 15 legislators out of 160 can boast to that record. He should be voting for us. The Speaker is very happy, but it's not good for you or for the city of Fall River. My opponent opposed home rule legislation to return civil service to Fall River so we could keep politics out of public safety, a poison to public safety so that we would never have the embarrassment again of a Coogan-type incident. My opponent opposed Brightman Street home rule petition, which resulted in the loss of jobs, the loss of small business, the demise of a neighborhood. He opposed home rule, he opposed the Meditech legislation that resulted in the loss of 800 jobs, jobs that paid more than $35,000 a year, lost forever. He was the only legislator who did not speak up, speak up for us when we needed it most. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a legislator who's going to work for us, speak for us, and fight for jobs for us. I am that representative. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sylvia, please hold, hold the applause in the interest of time until we are getting ready uh, towards the end when you want to express your feelings. Uh, you're welcome to do so, obviously. Um, Mr. Kevin Nagia, uh, you have three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. 
Hello, this is Kevin Aguiar, your state representative. For the past five years, I've been employed by you, the citizens of the 7th Bristol District, as your state representative. And I'm very pleased and proud to work for you and the city of Fall River. I want to thank the sponsors of this debate, the Fall River Democratic City Committee and Bristol Community College. But most importantly, I thank you, each and every citizen, for taking the time to listen to this debate in order to evaluate the work experiences and qualifications of myself and my opponent. I certainly do want to continue working for you as your state representative, but the decision on who will work as your state representative is up to you. My entire adult life has been about working to improve people's quality of life. I coach sports at Maplewood Park, Bishop Conley, and the CYO. I contribute and continue working with soup kitchens, feeding our neighbors, veterans in the time of need. I worked for many years at Citizens for Citizens, providing fuel assistance to keep families warm, working alongside Barbara Travis with Operation Christmas and so many other human service programs. With your support and votes, I got a chance to serve on the Fall River School Committee, leading the fight for accountability to prove our, and, and to improve our education system for eight years. And for the past five years as your state representative, I've done the hard work that was necessary to get the state funds and services to our district and our city as needed. I've, also, I've always made it a point as your state representative not to wait for my constituents to come to me or my office for help, but to be out in the district myself, visiting private homes, senior centers, housing developments, and to personally attend neighborhood meetings, listening, learning, and staying informed so that I, as your state representative, could be part of the problem-solving process. Being state rep for this district takes a lot of dedication, patience, time, and hard work, but the resulting funding and services for Fall River are well worth it. State Reps Paul Schmidt and Dave Sullivan and I worked together as this state's delegation team. We successfully fought for and obtained the funds that were needed to improve Fall River services and the quality of life here in Fall River. Fall River received an increase in Chapter 90 funds for our roads during the past two years to construct many roads in the 7th Bristol District. Additional state funds were received and targeted specifically to help our senior citizens. Fall River was reimbursed an additional half million dollars for our veteran services. And I've never forgotten and I never will forget the military service and sacrifice of my dad and other veterans. Because of what have they done for us, I've always done my best to say thank you. Our schools received an additional $2 million in State Chapter 70 in education money for new and improved programming, in addition to the millions of dollars in new, con new school construction. As your state representatives, we all fought for and received an increase of over $1.5 million in local aid, helping Fall River put more police officers on the, on the job and reestablish walking beats. Not a day goes by that I don't say thank you to you, the voters, for your vote of confidence in me as your state representative. I do enjoy tackling the difficult tasks that need to be done, and I am energized to do the best job possible as your state representative. I always give no less than 100% to working hard and getting results for our district and our city. This year, the election's on Thursday, September 6th, and if the results count for votes, then I hope I can count on your vote to keep me working for you. Your voter support will confirm to me that I've been doing a good job as your state representative. Thank you, and God bless. It will be, um, let us uh, get into the first question. Um, the rebuttal will be to the questions, not to the opening okay. statements. Okay, you asked about it. Um, the opening state, the, the first question that we would like to uh, have you address and share with the guests that are here tonight is this. In 2011, we witnessed the opening of the Veterans Memorial Bridge, and by the year 2016, the reconstruction and elimination of ramps at the southern end of Route 79 will be complete. Yet the state has shown little interest in what the city of Fall River feels is perhaps the most vital part of this project. The, the lowering of Route 79 between the Brightman Street Bridge and the Regatta. This would free up approximately 10 acres of land which could be used for economic development and tourism and also allow for better access to the waterfront. As a state representative, what would be your plan for acquiring money earmarked by the Federal Transportation Bill for use in the completion of the Route 79 project. Mr. Sylvia, would you address the answer, please? Sure, I think thank that you. Would be me. The Route 79 project, there's, there's still much confusion. Second. Last night, there was a public hearing. There was only five people in attendance. My opponent was not in attendance. My opponent wa first wanted the spaghetti ramps down, and now he flipped to say we need access to the city. Access to our city 
is extremely important. We need to work with Mass Highway to ensure that that happens. But there seems to be a problem with a connection and communication. There's only so much distance between the water and the railroad tracks. It is going to leave up, leave six acres of land, basically. There's a lot of work that has to be done. And I don't see that work being done. I don't see the communications. We can't even get a sign on the new bridge inviting us into, into, into Fall River. It took months to do that. We, can't, we don't even have the power or strength to get a sign to say Fall River is here. We can't get weeds that are seven feet high into the exit and exit ramps that lead into Fall River. Department of, of Economic Development had to send a letter to Mass Highway to get those re, le, weeds removed. That's in my opponent's district. Ladies and gentlemen, there's lots that we have to do to pay attention so that we don't lose access to this very important ability to get in and out of our community. Without that, Fall River is dead. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar, would yeah, you not, care to address that question? Yeah, this is my two minutes, correct? Yes, you yeah. have two minutes. Yeah, yes. thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I think it's very clear. I think it's very clear of exactly what's happening here in, uh, in Fall River relative to state financing of projects. But I'm not sure what the question, when you listen to the question, you say that it's assumed that the state's not listening. That's further from the, furthest from the truth, because the state is listening. The state's actually not only listening, they're putting their dollars in place. Those projects between the Brightman Street Bridge, the painting of the Braga Bridge, the spaghetti ramps being removed, the additional study that's going on for the project that this question refers to, it comes from the state and the federal government. So I'm not sure who thinks that nobody's listening. Not, they're not only listening, they're delivering because otherwise those projects wouldn't happen. My opponent just stated that the spaghetti ramps, I'm opposed to the spaghetti ramps. I have no idea where he comes from with some of these, these decisions that he's making, calling out whether I'm for or against something. If you want to know where I stand, ask me the question, and I'll tell you where I stand. Those spaghetti ramps are a project that's important to me, to Dave Sullivan, to Paul Schmidt, to Michael Rodericks, to Patricia Haddad, and to the entire delegation in the city of Fall River. I sat through 40, over 40 meetings listening and talking about those ramps, deciding how we can make sure that the businesses are going to get the needs that they make, whether it was the businesses on the waterfront, the businesses in the downtown, the businesses on Columbia Street. Throughout the district, we sat and worked those plans over and over and over again. I sat down with Gold Medal Bakery, the largest employer and one of the largest employers here, to talk about what, how they were going to deal with their uh, employees and deliveries from that project. And you know what? They're very happy with the project as it's going to go forward because they're going to have a safer, quicker route, and they're going to be able to hire more people based on those ramps cutting down their transportation time. So I'm not sure where we get saying that we're not listening. We are listening. My last points are relative to that middle span. That's the issue that's going to open up 10 acres, potentially 10 acres. There's a study that's going on in place right now. It's funded. We have uh, local people on it. I've communicated to the Department of Transportation that we have to do it. I had a conversation with Rep. Schmidt just last week and, and Councilor Dennis at Heritage Park relative to that issue. We're going to make sure it works, and we're going to make sure it works right for Fall River. Thank you. Mr. Sylvia, you have two minutes to rebut Mr. Aguiar's statement. I have been following closely. I heard my opponent on WSAR say that the spaghetti ramp that was coming into Fall River onto Millican Boulevard would have to come down. We have to make sure we have access to our city. Our city, we have serious economic problems right now in the city of Fall River. If we do not have access, our city will close. We need every opportunity to make sure people can get in and out of our city. We talk about tourism. How is that going to happen if we don't have the access that we need? We have to make sure that that, 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 that piece of land that is going to be available, which is not so large, is going to be utilized to improve our quality of life along the waterfront and while the project is going on to ensure that people can do business. That is my concern. Thank you. And Mr. Aguiar, you have yep. two minutes to rebut. Great. I think I just heard, I'm not positive, but I think I just heard some you know, conflicting information from my, my uh, opponent here because the fact of the matter is if you studied the issue as he stated that he did, that ramp that we're talking about coming off on Millican Boulevard, if we pushed for that project too hard, which our delegation did, all, each and every one of us did, we worked hard working with Mr. Karam to try and figure out a way to get that ramp and get access there. If we pushed so hard, and I think that's what my opponent just said, he wouldn't have tolerated that. Well, guess what? 
If that was the case, we would have lost the entire project, according to Federal Highway, because they had to approve it. So if you're telling me you want to lose the project based on a ramp, then go and do it. But I'll tell you what, we didn't decide that. We worked hard, all of the delegation together. And the ironic thing is, you know what the solution is to that problem? The solution to that problem is the Millican Boulevard extender that's going to go out where the Chamber of Commerce is going to go. And guess who brought that issue up over a year ago to Mass Highway? It was me, Kevin Aguiar, that told the delegation and suggested to them that we can do that to get some additional access as a compromise, because that's what legislating is all about. It's about a compromise, it's about working hard, and it's about getting results. And on this project, we all are getting results for the city of Fall River. Thank you very much. Let's go on to another question. We often hear the question, what can be done to make Massachusetts more business friendly? Many times the answer is to pass legislation that will benefit business at the expense of the worker. Name several ways that you believe the state can attract and retain business while advocating the decent wages and benefits for struggling families. You have two minutes, uh, Mr. Aguiar, to address that question. Thank you. There's many ways that we can do that, and there's many ways that we have done that. When we talk about uh, industries that work in, at the state government to decide what they're going to do and lobby for, more business-friendly practices. One of the leaders is the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. That's basically the small business uh, lobbying group for the entire state. And they're the resident expert on the issue. And Associated Industries of Massachusetts has stated, for the record, that this particular last two-year session is the most productive for business, small businesses in the most recent future and maybe even in, in forever. Because the fact is that we've done the right thing. When my opponent criticizes me for voting with Speaker DeLeo, I have voted with Speaker DeLeo a lot. You know why? Because he's right. He's right by making this a priority. This issue has been a priority for him, it's been a priority for us, and it's, be, and it's been a priority for the state senate. Some of the things that have happened, when you ask businesses, what is the most difficult thing they face right now? Health care costs. Health care costs are crippling to our small businesses. We passed, four years ago, we passed just a, a month ago, health care cost containment, bi small business health care cost containment, which is going to lower that cost for small businesses. Naturally, if it's common sense, if they don't have to spend the money on health care, they can pay those living wages that the question asked for. We talk about the uh, unemployment rate. We were faced with an unemployment rate that was going to go up based on the economy. What did the legislature do? We voted to freeze it, saving $300 per employee across the entire Commonwealth. Those are the type of, of pieces of legislation that we have to continue to work at. We talk about workforce development. Jack Sprager from BCC is going to be a beneficiary of this. The workforce training funds that we have and grants that, that we're going to be able to give to BCC to train the workers here in our, in our city and the surrounding community is going to keep our small businesses thriving. We've passed jobs bills. We've passed legislation on economic development, infrastructure. I could go on and on and on, but this is a hallmark of this le uh, legislation. For the past two years, this session has been great to small business. Thank you. Mr. Sylvia? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not, I'm not sure what small business my opponent is talking to. I just spoke the other day to Kurt's transmission. who would be happy to hire two more people. However, regulations are crippling them. We have done very little innovative in the state of Massachusetts. No innovation at all. You know, I'm gonna, I wanna, the first person I'm going to hire to create a job, I'm going to hire a legislative aide who lives in a district. My opponent has a legislative aide who makes 34000 a year, who not only doesn't live in the district with the highest unemployment on the East Coast, but he lives out of the state. We have a situation in the state of Massachusetts where we're not business friendly. Let's face it, ladies and gentlemen. How about an innovative idea like this, where the unemployment rate of Massachusetts is presently, the average is 6%. How about if we take every gateway city that exceeds that 6% by 2% and, and allow them and let, let them be deemed economic recovery zones? That could work. We would reduce their taxes, their state taxes, by 25 to 50%. That's for every small business and every new business moving into our community. 25 to 50 percent, depending on the hiring potential. We would also reduce all costs with regulations, either reduce them or eliminate those costs. And make, this would be a long-term plan, five to 10 years. And 
make those state agencies give priority to us, those communities that, have, that are economic in the recovery zone. Make them, that would increase business, that would bring new, new business in this community. No one else seems to be able to do it. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar, you have two minutes to rebut. Thank you. When we talk about regulatory reform, I guess regulatory reform is an issue. Of course it's an issue. And the legislature is dealing with it. Beginning in March, there's been a review of state regulations relative to small businesses. The first phase of it's going through, they're going to look at the regulations. Those that are ne not needed are going to be thrown out. Those that need to be changed are going to be changed. In all total, 2,000 regulations will be reviewed by the end of 2013. And my good colleague, Senator Rodericks, has been one of the leaders on this. He's been one of the leaders on small business. So when you talk about whether you're going to decide whether this state representative is not getting anything done, you're attacking all of my colleagues, and I take that personal because they work hard just like I work hard. And to go to another question, you want to talk about my legislative aid. Are you talking about Dan Raposa? Dan Raposa? Yes, absolutely. Dan Raposa, who was the ad administrative assistant to Carlton Viveris, who was a, a school business manager in the city of Fall River for over 10 years. He's been, he lived in the city for 45 years. He has a lot to offer to not only me, to this community, to all of these constituents. And I take offense to you attacking him, and let me tell you something. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The 7th Bristol District has been very well represented. They've been very well represented by Dan Raposa as my aide, and I'll put his credentials up against yours or anybody's. Never, questions? Questions later. Order, order, order. Excuse me. No. Excuse me. No, order. Excuse me. Could we please have order for you respect order for the candidates order. and yourself? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, Thanks, please. Jim. Yes, exactly. please. Please stay calm. Please relax. Mr. Sylvia, you have two minutes to rebut what you just this heard. This debating is not an easy thing. No. All right. Please calm down. Relax. This is uh, Mr. Sylvia has the floor. Shortly. Mr. Sylvia has two minutes to rebut what you've heard. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the highest unemployment. If you go online and Google the unemployment rates, we have one of the highest on the East Coast in the south end of Fall River. Mr. Raposo, who he's talking about, is already retired from the city as a municipal employee. You mean to tell me there's no one who lives in the district who needs a job that could qualify as legislative aid? We need someone who knows our district, who lives in the district. That's a job for us. We don't even have a district office that's open. He has five, one for his moving business, one that he shares with a restaurant and bar. He has an office that's not even open to constituent services. He gets $7,200 $7, a year for district services and fails to provide a service to our community to see you, to take care of your needs. We need someone who lives in that district to be a legislative aide, a job that I will create. Thank you. Please, no applause. Holy applause. Please, Holy please, applause. out of respect, we're asking that you not applaud in respect for time for the candidates. We have a You're list of questions on issues. You're taking away from the candidates please. if you interrupt, really. Let's, he let's hear from them, okay? Number three, a third question that we would like to propose to you both tonight um, is that the Federal Highway Administration reports that improving the state's infrastructure can be a significant boost to the state's economy. Not only would it create jobs, but it would also lower the cost of doing business and save lives. With over 40% of the major roads uh, and bridges in Massachusetts in need of major repairs, what steps would you take to assure that the state makes the investment needed to improve our state's infrastructure? Mr. Sylvia, you have two minutes. Thank you. 75% of all the roads and bridge money, resources, go within, inside of the 100, 128 beltway. 75% of that, those resources go within that, inside of that beltway, where there's 45% of the population. That leaves only 25% for all of those cities, including Fall River, for roads and bridges. The formula is wrong, folks as the formula is wrong for local aid. The formula is wrong for road and bridges. 
what it will take is for legislators in the South Coast and throughout the state, outside of the 128 Beltway, to band together, to work together to change the formula. We don't get what we deserve here. My opponent mentions it all the time, we don't get what we deserve. We don't get what we deserve, we have no voice, we have no teeth. We have to do something about it. Voting with the speaker 100% of the time gets us nothing. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar, you have two minutes to answer the question. Sure, what are we gonna do with the uh, accelerated bridge program? Right. That already exists. It exists because of Governor Patrick, Lieutenant Governor Murray, the delegation across the entire Commonwealth. The accelerated bridge project is the reason why the bridge is getting painted. The accelerated bridge program is the reason why those spaghetti ramps are coming down. The accelerated bridge program is why we just fixed the, uh, the old Reitman Street Bridge. We're spending almost a half a billion dollars here in Fall River. Add to that the ramps up on exit eight and a half B, eight B rather. We're getting a half a billion dollars in money to come down to this area. And it's not only me, it's the entire delegation. And I like to give credit to my colleagues in government. But I'll tell you what, the fact is, is that if we're getting half a billion dollars in, in benefits here, I don't think that's anything to shake a stick at. We need to applaud that, we need to support that, we need to continue to support those bond programs. The fact is, the federal highway comes in, the federal government doesn't have any money right now either. So we have to leverage and work with people, not against people, not calling people out, not, not bullying people. We have to learn how to work with people. And that's exactly what I do, that's exactly what the delegation does, and we're bringing that money here to uh, the city of Fall River, and we're gonna continue to do that. That program exists, and you're gonna see, by the end of 2016, those spaghetti ramps will be up, the jobs will be here, and the fact of the matter is, the infrastructure throughout the entire Commonwealth benefits people that work here, that live here, because they don't have to work only in Fall River. They can work in projects in Taunton, the casino project if it goes to Taunton, or in Boston, there's a lot of people that live in this district that travel out. So across the Commonwealth, we need to work together to continue the good work that's being done. Thank you. Mr. Sylvia, you have two minutes to rebut. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not sure about the accelerated programs that my opponent is talking about. We've had a bridge that's, that's been being painted and under construction since I've been, I don't know, uh, 15 years ago. We, we, they, took us, they took them five years to put a ceiling under the government center. I could have found, found two construction companies on Columbia Street to put that ceiling up in two months. We're getting ripped off. None of this is quick. This is a disaster. My opponent keeps calling upon his, his legislative delegation for his support. Come on, what has he done? What is he doing for the district? Next year, that same delegation will be supporting me. We need to be doing things to help us now. What has he done for us in our district? Thank you. Mr. Aguilar, you have two minutes to rebut. The fact of the matter is, is this kind of behavior is what's gonna get us nothing at the State House, I can tell you that. Because you need to work please, with people, not please. against people. But the fact of the matter is, is you just don't understand, Mr. Sylvia. You don't know what the accelerated bridge project is, and two minutes ago you criticized me for not being at meetings relative to the spaghetti ramp project. Dave Dennis has been in those meetings. Paul silva has been there. Everybody's been there. They know what the accelerated bridge program is, but apparently you don't understand. You just don't get it. But the fact is, it's here, it's existing, and it's getting the job done for us. And to go back to a prior comment that you made relative to my aide being retired, you've been on disability for how long, sir? And you're going to come back now and want to oh, work too? Please. It's the same exact please. thing that you're, you're speaking out Thank of both you. sides of your mouth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let us continue with the fourth question to the two candidates here this evening. As our state representative, can we trust that you will vote the needs of your district and state before those of the Speaker of the House, even if it could be a political liability. Would you please address that question, Mr. Aguiar? Absolutely. This one won't even take two minutes because it's very clear. The fact of the matter is when you get a job, no matter what that job is, you have to figure out how to survive in that job and how to get the best you can for your district, for your constituency, for your business, no matter what the job is. And the fact is when you go to the State House, the first thing you understand is there's a system in place. You have to live within that system. And I, do, I did vote with the speaker 100% of the time, but you know what? I have a great relationship with the speaker and leadership. And when we need something for this district, the reason why I can vote for most of the things that come out of the office of the speaker is because our needs are already being met in that bill. And if you have a relationship with them, you can get that done. If you have an attitude like my opponent has, you're gonna get nothing done. That's the facts, let's live with them. 
Mr. Sylvia, you have two minutes to address the question. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very positive attitude. When I'm elected state representative, I will work with leadership. I will work with our delegation. I am a communicator. I have been all my life. And the problem is, I will be voting with leadership when it's good for Fall River. When it is for, isn't good for Fall River, I will respectfully oppose. I will be in no one's back pocket. They will know immediately, soon, that they will respect me because Alan Sylvia is not for sale. I am going to be voting for the people of this city and not for a special interest group, not for a transgender group. I'm going to be voting for the people of our community. Thank you. Would you care to rebut for two minutes, Mr. Aguiar? Absolutely. The fact is, when you, if you, anybody goes to Boston, and when I first got elected, I got some advice. I talked to my predecessor, Robert Correa, who was a state representative for 30 years, who happens to be one of your advisors, somebody that you're very close with. And I think he was good for 30 years up at the State House. You know what he gave me for advice? He said, whatever you do, Kevin, stay close to the speaker because you'll get nothing done if you don't do that. You have to know the system. That came from your top advisor, giving me advice. And you know what? I've taken his advice, and I've remained close to the speaker in leadership. And you know what? He was right on this one. He hasn't been right on all of them, but on this one he was right, and we're getting things done because of it. So maybe you should go back to your advisor and ask him what his opinion is. Mr. Sylvia, would you care to rebut for two minutes? Ms. Aguiar, you know Bob Correa. Bob Correa brought jobs for 32 years. He brought millions of jobs, millions of dollars in infrastructure into our community. <laughs> millions. And believe me, he didn't carry anyone's water. He went up there and was a statesman, supported our people, had a district office that was open every day, five days a week, something that you, your office hasn't been opened at all. You're paid to do it, and the people go without services. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a representative that's going to make sure that you have an office and that you have a place to go, and that you no longer have to beg to call to get someone's attention or not get a call back. Thank you. Let us continue with another question. Do you feel that renewable energy programs such as solar, wind, or trash to energy are viable options to our energy needs? Would you care to address that, Mr. Sylvia? Absolutely. We, we all know that energy is very important to our community. There was a plan uh, to harness the Quickishan River. I thought that was an excellent plan. Uh, we have to start looking at ways to, to remove the methane gas from the trash, trash moor mountain. We have to look at different ways we could possibly bring a company into our community to work with the Office of Economic Development to do something that is going to renew energy for us so that we can be sustainable. No commonwealth, no city in the commonwealth is sustainable right now, but Fall River had the potential to have those resources. We should be doing everything we can to work with companies to put solar power up there on, on Trashmore or wherever else we could harness energy. We have to do much more. I've heard very little about that from my opponent and from the State House. Ms. Aguiar, would you care to address the energy issue? Absolutely, absolutely. The energy issue has been a hallmark of Deval Patrick's campaign to delegate uh, the entire legislature for the past four years. They've passed, we've passed several bills related exactly to this issue. But when you're talking about creating jobs through the green economy, it has to make sense. No one is going to create a job if the numbers do not make sense. And the fact is, is right now, the, the trash to uh, energy, the numbers do not make sense yet. It's getting there, but that will happen whenever the numbers make sense. Right now, they don't. You talk about solar energy. Solar energy, uh, solar, uh, energy and solar panels and, and all that is, is being done now more than ever before. And I've worked closely with the, on the Revenue Committee relative to a tax issue on that same issue because people came to us and said, we will not create this project of 500 or 1,000 uh, solar panels unless you do something to give us a certainty on what the reimbursement is going to be, what the renewable energy credits are going to be, and make sure that the numbers work for them. I've lived it. I've worked it. Everyone in the, in the State House is very well aware of it. Just uh, two weeks ago, we passed an energy bill that's dealing with exactly these issues. They're going to continue to work towards making renewable energy jobs more affordable and giving incentives and credits 
But where do the credits come from? When you create a credit, it has to come from somewhere. And that's money that we do not have to do for other programs. So it's a balancing act. It's, it, you have to balance between cutting programs, adding programs, and putting renewable energy credits or tax credits to create jobs. It's a balancing act. It's very complicated. But the fact is this, that we are doing it, and we're going to continue to do it, and I fully support it. Mr. Sylvia, would you care to rebut? Ladies and gentlemen, it won't be too long and far of what we're going to be paying for our trash bags to be outside as other communities. We should be working on this now. Our legislators should be working with us in Boston to make sure that we can resolve this problem before it's too late. We have to find a way for renewable energy to use our trash and turn it into electricity, turn it into power. We hear a lot about what we passed, but I don't see anything getting done. And we're going to be stuck two years from now or three years from now, and we're going to be paying for trash, and the people of Fall River can't afford it. We can't afford it. We can't afford an additional penny for energy or, or for any other service right now. We have to find a way now to ensure that there is, there is use for that property up there that is going to produce energy and not just talk. Thank you. I think the question was related to renewable energy jobs right. and, and that green sector of the economy. That was, question was not about the landfill and the trash in Fall River. But if you don't know the answer to the question, you go back to something like that. But the fact is there is going to be an issue with that landfill and we have to work at it. But when you look at the numbers and you study the numbers like the city of Fall River has been doing, the city councilors have been working on it, there's task force in place to make sure that that happens. You have to know the numbers. If you can get, take your trash for $50 a ton to CMAS and, and burn it legally and by the law and in the standards, then you better do it a lot cheaper than that before you're going to start talking about doing anything else on that. We looked at bills which you can't do on our landfill to put solar farms, uh, solar panels on other landfills across the Commonwealth. But the question was about green jobs and renewable energy jobs. And that's where we talk about the legislation. That's where we talk about the regulations. And the fact is, is we're easing those. It's not creating regulations. It's easing regulations going back to the first question. How do you get small businesses around and get, let them to thrive? You do that by creating an atmosphere where they can get the credit. They can make the numbers work for them. It's good for the economy. It's good for the jobs. And it's good for the Commonwealth. Those are the things that are happening. I don't see any problem with it. I think we're working hard at changing things and adding and adding, and that's how you legislate. You keep making progress. You work hard, and you get results. Thank you. We have one final question that we would like you to address tonight before you get to your closing statements. And the question is, what is your position concerning casino gambling? Explain your reason being for or against. And the question we'll address to Mr. Aguiar first. Yeah, casino gambling. I, I'm a supporter of the casino. I voted for the expanded gaming, uh, gaming plan. But before I did that, I had to make sure that the numbers made sense. Because if it's, a, if it's even, where we're going to get a few jobs and we're going to have a lot of uh, you know, trouble with the different quality of people that are going to be here in our district, then we wouldn't be able to, uh, to have that. But the jobs weighed out. Jobs is the most important issue to my constituents, the most important uh, to the Southeastern Massachusetts, Massachusetts contingent, and I voted for that. With that being said, we cannot only say we want jobs from the casino because that's a long, long ways out. We look at the biopark that we created, an opportunity to have a UMass facility working with my colleagues to make sure we're going to get hundreds of jobs at that site once the UMass facility is up and running. So the jobs are the most important issue that we have going. I supported the casino. I uh, supported the compact because we need to get this going, and if it doesn't happen in Taunton, we need to make sure we put pressure on the Gambling Commission because we cannot be shut out here in Fall River in the Southeast and Massachusetts area. That's what we worked on as a delegation. I worked on it hard, and we're going to continue to put the pressure on that commission. If we're, if we're not going to have it here in Taunton, then we need to have it in our area because the people are hurting and the people need jobs. Mr. Sylvia? Ladies and gentlemen, my opponent didn't always support casino gaming. As a matter of fact, he flip-flopped on casinos. He was against casinos, and then he was for casinos. Just like so many different issues, flip-flopping one way to the other. He was against casinos, and then folks for the union went to him, and suddenly he changed his mind about being for casinos. Let's face it, ladies and gentlemen, casinos are here. Whether they're good or bad for us, we will soon see. It looks like casinos are going to be going to Taunton. 
Those jobs that are going to be in Taunton, we need to have at least a 20-mile mitigation zone. The revenues that are going to be collected by the casino that go to the state, part of that money should be coming to those communities that are 20 miles within the area. That mitigation zone would be to protect those cities that are going to be feeling the ramifications of casinos so that that would help our police department and fire department and give us some of the revenue that we need. We need to ensure that those jobs are going to be available at our career center for people who reside in the city of Fall River so that they can get up there to the casino. We need to be sure that there's transportation to the casino. We, there's lots that we have to do about casino gambling. But please, let me assure you, he wasn't for casino. He's for casino now. We should be for jobs no matter where they are. We need jobs so bad, people are lost in the South End. No one's working. I knock door to door, and they're all home. No one's working in the entire half of the city of Fall River. Thank you. Mr. Hagia, yeah, would you care to rebut for two minutes, please? Yeah, I'm going to use my time to rebut to talk about the fire chief issue because the fire chief issue has been brought up earlier in the, in the, uh, in the debate. The fire chief civil service issue is something that I looked very strongly at uh, right from the start when the city of Fall River decided to go back to the civil to take it out of civil service a few years ago when the entire fire department was decimated with layoffs. The fact is I studied the issue. We looked at the issue. I offered an alternative to the union. I offered an alternative to the city who consequently never came to us beforehand to say, what do you think about this home rule petition we want to file? So my research was done after the fact. I sat down with the delegation. I sat down with the uh, local fire firefighters who I highly, highly respect. And we talk about whether this home rule petition should pass or not. And you know what? We had good dialogue on several occasions with them. I've, I've looked at the issue, and we talk about creating a situation where we're going to have a fire chief that's going to be in the last few years of his career, or are we going to talk about a long-term fire chief, somebody that over a period of 10 years can have a long-term sustainable plan for the fire department without the influence of politics and mayoral decisions on whether they're going to be a, a fire, uh, the chief or not. They're going to serve at the will of the, chief, uh, the mayor, or they're going to serve on the civil service. So speaking to those folks, I've come around on the issue. I've talked to them about it, and uh, the uh, home rule petition, working with my colleagues tomorrow, will be passed at the State House so that the civil service uh, provision will be back in for the chief. Now, further than that, when we talk to those folks about whether we need a chief of fire that could go for a long-term plan, I ask when we go to Boston, they ask me, why is the police chief not? And I think that's a good question. I think that's a real good question, why the police chief is not. And I'm going to recommend to the council, I'm going to recommend to the mayor, that based on my deliberations and my studying, talking to the fire department, the same issue applies in the police department. Just so happens, we got it right with Dan Racine, we got it wrong with Mike Coogan. So we need to go back to civil service on both, not just the fire chief, and I support that issue. Thank you. Mr. Sylvia, we... We got off the question. question. That's okay. I'd like to stay on that, please. Casino. So in all fairness, you have the freedom to address either yes. the issue of casino gambling or rebut. Ladies and gentlemen, we see a heard. perfect example of my opponent flip-flopping again. <laughs> Against casino for casino home rule petition. He had plenty of time to do that. Why did he, why did he oppose home rule petition? Well, I have to ask you, you connect the dots or connect the pens. We needed to make, ensure that civil service was there so we could keep the poison of politics out, which we see every day in Fall River with the Coogan incident, and it continues. We got to keep it out of the school department. Ladies and gentlemen, he flip-flopped again on, on, on the home rule petition. He, he mentioned the, the police supporting him, the fire support. They're not so happy with you, Mr. Aguiar, at this moment in time. You can't change one day and go back the next day. You were, you were against the homebrew petition, but it was bad advice from your advisor, Mayor Flanagan. I'll tell you that right now, Mr. Mr. Aguiar. Those, we, need, we need to have civil service in this community desperately because of all places in this, this city in particular, we have politics that have creeped in to every corner. We can't get anything done. We are hiring people that shouldn't be there. We're losing auditors left and right. Civil service needs to be returned to this community immediately. And if you are getting that passed tomorrow, Mr. Aguiar, returning home rule petition, that's the best thing you've done in four and a half years. Thank you. Mr. Please. Thank you. Mr. Aguiar, you have three minutes for a closing statement. 
Yeah, before I go to my closing statement, I'm going to comment on that issue. Mr. Yeah, Sylvia, Mr. Sylvia, let me just tell you something. The reason, the reason, close, listen, close the reason the why we, the reason why we're here on the civil service issue is because your guy Bob Correa is the one that pulled it out of civil you're service. Lucky, you're lucky. You're lucky. Okay, okay, you're lucky Bob Correa time. left, or you wouldn't even be a rep today. Okay. You're okay. lucky he left. This to be. Okay. No more. No more. No more. We have young Let's have children. Water. Let's have water. We Excuse gotta have water. Me. We need. Ex we got. Excuse argument. me. You're, what you you've done is you've already argument. cut into their time. So instead of That's three right. minutes for a closing statement, they only have two minutes. And please, uh, if so, you, if Mr. Aguiar, by the flip of the coin, you're first. Two minutes. I'm go second. He went first on the. Uh, he no, went you first go. On you go. Two. But he went first at the opening, and then you just you, you always do it afterwards. They did it just the opposite. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll do the. No, I'll do, I, that's fine. No, I just want to make sure we're on the right page. Yep. Well, it's been certainly an informative and interesting debate, and I thank the committee and VCC for providing this forum to discuss the issues, providing the voters an opportunity to review the qualifications we have to be state representative. But again, I want to say thank you to each and every voter who has taken the time to listen and watch this debate. And after all said and done, it's the citizens who vote to hire the state representative. And through the questions asked and the answers provided, our individual statements, our stance on issues, along, uh, along with a review of our people's skills and ability to work and get things done, it will be clear who you want to be state representative for the 7th Bristol District. Political science stickers, slogans, and money spent in other marketing mediums mean a lot in campaigns, but that's not, not what wins elections. Elections are decided by you, the voters who check out the candidates and separate fact from fiction. Elections are then won by the candidate who's able to show through facts, not fiction or political rhetoric, that he's the best person for the job. It's a fact that I've given no less than 100% of effort and energy to being the best state representative possible. And that State Representative Schmidt, Sullivan, and I have worked together getting the state the funding we need for education, road repairs, job development, and veterans. The fact is that the 7th Bristol District, we receive considerably more funding than many throughout the Commonwealth. And additional state funding and services don't happen by accident. It happens as a result of hard work. Our success in obta obtaining state funds verifies that as your state representative, I'm dedicated and determined to improve your quality of life. In the coming weeks, the political campaigning will certainly get busy and tough. And now that we are out of session, you can count on seeing me going door to door, corner to corner, respectfully asking for your vote on Thursday, September 6th. Now you urge each voter to go out to the polls on election day. But without a doubt, your vote counts. If you are not satisfied with the job performance of an incumbent, don't vote for them. If you are satisfied with their job performance, then go out and vote. But regardless, vote. And I invite you to join us in our campaign to fight to keep the good things happening here in Fall River. We have a website, a telephone, email, and I'm going to give you my cell number, 774-930-4887. If you ever need me, I'll be there for you. Thank you, good night, and God bless. Thank you. Well, it, you know, Mr. Sylvia now has two minutes for a closing statement. Thank you, everyone. I, I want to thank all of you for your interest in this election. This election is going to be decided on Thursday, September 6th. There's no final election. My opponent or I will be your next state representative. We need to have strong representation on Beacon Hill. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to choose wisely because we've made lots of mistakes. My opponent has a campaign slogan, works hard, gets results. Ladies and gentlemen, if he is working hard and getting results, who is he getting those results and working hard for? He opposed the home rule legislation to get to take politics out of, out of civil service. He opposed Brightman Street that resulted in the loss of jobs. He, he opposed home the Medita uh, Meditech legislation that resulted in the loss of 800 jobs never to return again. He, he was admonished two days on WSAR for doing that in the Herald News. He said he didn't want to upset the Secretary of State. Ladies and gentlemen, when I'm your state representative, my only concern about who I'm upsetting will be you, not the Secretary of State. I'll work with them, I told you. No one will own me. I'll be voting for you. And ladies and gentlemen, with your support and the grace of God, I ask you to vote Alan Sylvie for state representative on September 6th. Thank you. This is amazing and wonderful all at the same time.
But it is democracy, and this is uh, how privileged we are to be a part of a, a country where this can happen and to voice our opinions. And now the job is up to you on Thursday, uh, September 6th, to go to the polls and vote, as these candidates have suggested, because now you have the voice. So thank you, all everybody, for being here, the candidates for sharing their views, and to all of you, good night and God bless. Um, and just so that everyone knows, the next debate is for the...